But today we're beginning a new message series which I've called Rescued, and it's based on the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And so the book of Ruth is, is really a beautiful love story that shows God at work in a time of great distress in the nation of Israel. And to help us to better understand the book of Ruth, this morning we're going to look at the historical setting of Ruth before we actually begin the book of Ruth next Sunday. And so the order of the books uh, of the Bible before Ruth, it goes uh, Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth, which is basically following a historical timeline. In the book of Joshua, Joshua the leader went in, led Israel to conquer and occupy the promised land. And so the following book, the book of Judges, tells us what happened in Israel after Joshua died up to the time when Israel began to have kings, which is talked about in the next book after Ruth, which is 1 Samuel. And so the book of Ruth comes right after the book of Judges, and it begins with this verse in Ruth 1, 1. It says, in the days when the judges ruled. And so that verse tells us that Ruth took, the book of Ruth took place during the time period in Israel covered by the book of Judges. And so today we're going to set the background for the book of Ruth by getting an overview of what happened during the Judges. Today's message is entitled Against Culture. And we're going to look at the culture in the time of the book of Judges in Israel. The culture at that time, it was decadent, it was violent, it was rebellious, it was immoral. And we're going to see many parallels <clears throat> between the culture in the time of the Judges and the culture today in America. The book of, of Judges can be summed up in the very last verse of the book, which is found in Judges 21-25. <clears throat> it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so there was no king. There was no godly authority in Israel. There was no adherence to the truth of God's word. Idolatry was rampant. There was no absolute right and wrong. Everybody thought, well, if, if it feels good, I'm going to do it. If I think it's okay to do, then I'm going to do it. And what you think is right to do, you do it. Each person made their own decisions about what was right and wrong, not based on the absolute standard of God's word, but based on their own opinions. And so, in effect, truth was relative in Israel those days. And so each person, in essence, was their own God, deciding what was right and wrong, and leading to worshiping idols rather than the true God. And as we study in more detail today this culture in the time of Judges, we're going to be able to understand what is happening in our culture today in America. I believe that our culture is spiraling downward farther and farther away from God. Many American churches trying to be relevant are chasing culture to try to be relevant and they're going down that same spiral away from God's Word. Many people today believe all kinds of things that are completely contrary to what God's Word says. Some people realize it's what's God, what God's Word says is contrary to what they believe, and many do not even understand that what they believe is contrary to God's Word. And so, it would be an apt statement for our culture today that everyone is doing what they feel is right in their own eyes. And so we're going to be speaking of this very dark and wicked time in the history of Israel. It parallels our culture today. And yet as we move on next Sunday to the book of Ruth, we're going to see that the book of Ruth is a book of hope. It's, it's like a star shining in a black night. It's like a, a diamond dazzling on a, on a piece of black velvet. And we're going to see in the book of Ruth people who stayed faithful to God, people who stayed faithful to one another, people who went against the culture of their day, and God blessed them. And so that next Sunday is Mother's Day. We're going to be looking at Ruth chapter 1 with a message entitled Radical Decisions, the decisions that have to be made in a, in a culture that's against God in order to follow God. But today we're going to look at the book of Judges, and we want to understand how culture shifts you can follow along in the white page in the middle of your program. It has the scriptures written out as well as the outline. 
Judges 2 verse 7 says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And so Joshua and the leaders of his generation, they'd seen God work many miracles. Many miracles had to happen for them to enter into, conquer, and occupy the promised land. And they understood the greatness of God. They'd seen God work with their own eyes. They saw the rivers divided as they moved into the promised land. They saw the walls of Jericho collapse. They'd seen many military victories. And so the culture of Israel during the days of Joshua was a God-fearing culture during the time of his generation. But each generation must know God. Verse 10 says, And all that generation, that is Joshua's generation, also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. And so the next generation, the generation after Joshua, which included his children and other leaders' children, was different than Joshua's generation. First of all, they did not know the Lord. They did not have a relationship with him. They did not have faith in God. They did not believe in him, nor did they seek to serve him. And secondly, they did not know about the miracles that the Lord had done in their father's generation. The miracles that had led them to be living in the promised land. So how did the culture shift so drastically in one generation? Well, although Joshua's generation conquered the promised land, they did not pass their faith on to their children. That's what happened. They did not teach their children about God's miracles. They did not train their children to believe in God. And the result of that failure to pass the faith to the next generation was disastrous. Because the next generation abandoned God and that led to idolatry. Verse 12, and they, speaking of the generation after Joshua, abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. And so this new generation in the promised land abandoned God who had allowed them to come into the promised land. The God who had rescued them from slavery, or at least their forefathers and grandparents, in the land of Egypt. Now the Bible teaches us that everyone worships something. Sometimes we think there are people that don't worship anything. But everybody worships something. So if you abandon God, if you abandon worshiping the true God, you're going to worship something else. And so this generation began to worship the idols, the gods of the people who lived in that land of Canaan that they had come into in the society around them. And so they turned away from God. There was a lure of this decadent culture that was in the promised land that was in Canaan. It enticed them to begin to worship the idols of the gods of the society that they lived among. And so they turned away from God. Now, why do people worship idols? I mean, sometimes we think, it's, well, it doesn't make sense to us. Why do people worship idols? Why did they worship idols back then? Why do people worship idols today in America? Because idols offer something or appear to offer something that people want. Back then, the idols promised good harvest. You worship this idol. You bring in offerings to this idol. And this idol, people believe this idol would give them good harvest. The rains would come. The storms would stay away. And so they began to worship the idols because of what they offered. Now today, idols promise money. They promise pleasure. They promise power. And nothing really has changed other than the names of the idols. We're going to talk more about idolatry in a few minutes. But the result of that generation abandoning God was that the Lord was angry with them. They provoked the Lord to anger. And that's not a good thing because forsaking God brings judgment. Verse 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies and they were in terrible distress. And so in his anger, God did what? He removed his protection from the nation of Israel. 
They were no longer protected by his power, and they began to be plundered and robbed by their enemies that surrounded them. Their idols could not deliver them, and they were in, as we see in the last sentence, terrible distress. And that's how culture shifts. From one generation, Joshua's generation, being blessed and inheriting the promised land to the next generation, living in that promised land, but now being in terrible distress. No longer worshiping God, abandoning God, and worshiping worthless idols. Now, the last two generations in America uh, have been named by many as the millennial generation, which is people aged roughly 20 to 34, millennials, and then Gen Z, which is teenagers and below. That's the generation following the millennials. So teenagers today are Gen Z, at least that's my understanding of it. And these two generations, bolsters have surveyed them and they've seen massive shifts and these generations, understanding of God's word, engagement in sinful, decadent behavior in a corresponding exodus from the church. And these changes, sometimes people say, well, that's young people of all ages. And no, these changes are on a far greater degree than the generations previous to it. We are seeing an accelerated downward spiral in our time, generation after generation. Here's a video with some statistics of the opinions of youth, and I, I believe it's a little bit dated, and so these statistics are probably much worse today. I'm not sure exactly when this was made, but it's a, it's a, it's a little bit dated. We'll look at a few more uh, current statistics, but this is a wake-up call just watching these. So we see in those, <clears throat> in those statistics many beliefs that run contrary to the truth of God's Word. The percentage of Gen Z, which is the teens of today, that identify as atheists, they don't believe in any God, is double that of the rest of the adult population, including the millennials. So in one generation, the percentage of millennials uh, to the percentage in Gen Z has doubled the number of people who believe there is no God at all. Now, why is this happening? Well, it's happening the same reason that it happened in Joshua's, the generation after Joshua, there's been a failure, a failure of parents, a failure of schools, a failure of churches to pass a godly faith on to the next generation. And yet God is still at work. Even in cultures that are spiraling away from him, God is still at work. He was at work in the time of judges because God provided anointed leaders. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered him who plundered them. And so what happens when people are in great distress and their idols aren't saving them? They call out to God, oh God, help me, I'm in great distress. And God heard their cry and he raised up anointed leaders called judges to save the people of Israel from their enemies. In the book of Judges, God raised up 13 different judges as we go through the whole book. Two of the most well-known are Gideon and Samson. Now, if you read the story of both of them, you'll find they were both very flawed individuals. They were not uh, exactly the most righteous people, but God used them to rescue his people and to turn back the hearts of the people of Israel to him for a short period of time. But these anointed leaders must be followed. Verse 17, yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked and who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. And so after the judges delivered the people from their enemies, things weren't so bad. They weren't in such great distress. What happened? The people did not follow the judges as they were walking after God. They did not walk in God's ways. Rather, the scripture tells us they prostituted themselves to other gods or idols. And so God equates idol worship with prostitution. Now, how, how is that? Uh, how do we explain that? Well, a believer is in essence in a, a faith relationship with God. 
In fact, in the New Testament, it speaks of the church being what? The bride of Christ. And so it is as if it's a, uh, a covenant relationship, like a marriage relationship. And when the people of Israel turned away from God, turned away from their relationship with God, to their committed relationship with God, they offered themselves to idols for payment. They wanted what the idols had. They wanted to receive a benefit from the idols, just as a prostitute offers herself to someone else to get a benefit, to be paid. And so not only were they unfaithful to God, they worshipped the idols because they thought the idols would give them a benefit, that they would pay them. And so the previous generation had followed God. The generation of Joshua had obeyed God, but the next generation's generation and generations following did not. And so the destructive cycle spiraled downward. Verse 19, whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. And so when a particular judge died, even though the people weren't following them, the next generation became even more corrupt. They continued and even in greater degree chased after the gods of the Canaanites, the gods of the uh, pagan people around them, and they served them. And so rather than obeying God, they stubbornly refused to repent of their wicked ways or to change those ways. And so we see as we read through the book of Judges, this downward spiral into increasingly decadent, evil, wicked generations. The last episode in the book of Judges is found in Judges 19 through 21, just before the book of Ruth, just before you get to the book of Ruth. And that episode could come from our nightly news uh, today. And so I'm going to begin this story. It's over three chapters. I'm just going to begin the story so we get some idea of what was going on in Israel in the time of the judges before the book of Ruth is introduced. You can read the whole story, uh, chapters 19 through 21, this week. And so the story begins with a Levite. The Levites were priests. They were supposed to be men of God, walking in, in God's way, following his way, teaching the people God's way. And as we'll find out, there are no heroes in this story. And so the Levite had a concubine who ran away from him. A concubine is a, like a second-class wife. And so it indicated the Levite had multiple wives, which was uh, forbidden by God's law. And not only did he have multiple wives, obviously he had marriage problems because his concubine ran away from him. We don't know what he did, but she probably had her reasons. So the Levite went to search for his concubine. He found her concubine at her father's house. She went home to daddy uh, to be safe. He found her there, and he stayed there for a while, and then he took his concubine and began to journey back to his home. It was a long, he had started late in the day, and it was a long journey. And so that first night, they arrived at the town of Gibeah at dusk. That was not his hometown. They were on the way. They came into the town square of Gibeah, and an old man was there. And he ominously warned them, don't spend the night in the square. It's not safe. And so they decided to spend the night with the old man. And so he took them into his home and welcomed them there. They went to sleep, but during the night, the men of the city surrounded the house, and they began to pound on the door, and they demanded that the old man bring the Levite out, the priest out, so that these men could rape him. The old man refused. He said, I can't do that. Instead, he said, take my daughter and the Levite's concubine, and you can do whatever you want with them. Well, these wicked homosexual men refused the offer. They said, we want the man. We want the Levite. And so finally, the Levite, to save his own life, forced his concubine to go out. And the men of the city gang raped her all night long. The next morning, the Levite wakes up. 
And of course, you wonder what he was doing all night long when his concubine was being abused and neglected, abused and, and uh, tormented, tortured. The next morning, the Levite opened the door and his concubine was lying dead on the doorstep. And so he took her body and put it on his donkey and headed back home. And when he got home, he took out a knife and cut her body into 12 pieces and sent the pieces to the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's just the introduction to the story. And the story goes on for chapters, and there's violence. There's much more killing and ungodly behavior. There are no heroes, as I said, in this story. It's, it's a world far away from God, a world that is, is abandoned God, or violence of all kinds in ungodly uh, sexual behavior is exalted. And that is what happens in a culture that abandons God. And so godless culture, the Bible tells us here, is a, is a test for believers. Verse 21, God says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. And so God is saying now that he's not going to drive out the remaining Canaanite nations. That was Joshua's job to do. He didn't finish the job. And God said, well, it's not going to get finished now. I'm going to leave them there in order to test you. The test will be whether you're going to continue to follow my ways, the ways of the Lord, continue to worship me and follow my commands, or you're going to follow the idolatrous ways of the Canaanite nations around you. And so culture... Ungodly culture tests our obedience. Judges 3, 4 says, They, speaking of these ungodly nations, were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And so this ungodly culture was to test whether they would continue to obey God or follow the direction of the nations around them. Whether they would follow the peer pressure of the culture or keep their own culture true to God. Every generation must make the decision whether to obey God or to rebel and follow the ungodly culture around us. Not only did culture test the obedience of Israel, it also tested their relationships. Verse 6, And their daughters, speaking of the daughters of the people of Israel, they took to them, well, no, sorry, and their daughters, speaking of the daughters of the Canaanites, the ungodly, unbelieving Canaanites around them, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives. And their own daughters, they, uh, the Israelites' daughters, they gave to their sons, the sons of the Canaanite nations, unbelieving nations, and they served their gods. And so here we see how a generation is completely lost to the ways of the Lord. When the children of godly parents marry unbelievers. It was strictly forbidden in the Old Testament for Israelites to marry unbelievers, unbelieving non-Israelites. And it's strictly forbidden in the New Testament for believers to marry unbelievers. And why is that case? Well, we see the result in this verse, which is they began to serve the gods of the unbelievers, the idols of the unbelievers. Now, some people think Maybe they thought that back then. Some people think it today. Well, if I marry an unbeliever and I'm a believer, maybe I can win them to the Lord. Maybe I can lead them to the Lord. And yet the result shown in this verse, whenever a son or daughter from an Israelite or godly family marries an unbelieving spouse, they're going to end up serving the idols of the unbelievers. That is the general rule. Now, through prayer, God can still work miracles today. But it's rare. It's rare when somebody marries an unbeliever that the unbeliever becomes saved. And so when you look at the state of Israel during the time of the judges, or you look at the state of America today, which there are great parallels, we might think it seems hopeless. And yet God always has a remnant of faithful believers who follow him. He's promised in his word in the time of Israel, in the time today, he's always going to have a remnant. We're going to see that remnant of faithful believers 
as we begin to study the book of Ruth next week. As I said today, on Mother's, as I said before, on Mother's Day, we're going to start with Ruth chapter 1 and talk about radical decisions that Ruth and Naomi made. And it's going to be an encouraging and hope-filled message, so we encourage you to bring a friend, invite a friend to our special Mother's Day service. But even when we face a society that we see is increasingly turning its back on God, as we see in America today, God is still on the throne. He's there to sustain us. He's there, there to bless us. Bless you as you refuse to go with the flow of the culture. Instead, we choose to go against. That's why I chose the title today, Against Culture. And see many who are lost saved. Now one of the things that encourages me about the times that we live in. Is that the difference between true believers and unbelievers is becoming more and more apparent. For those with eyes to see. For a long time there was a fuzzy. And there still is some. But there was a fuzzy middle ground of those who claim to be believers but aren't. And there still are those. I mean, 80-some percent of Americans still claim to be Christians. But when you look at their behavior, their beliefs, their actions, and you look at God's Word, you see there's a huge disconnect there. And so just because you claim to be something doesn't make you something. Uh, a person is a Christian who is following the truth of God's Word. And so that fuzzy middle ground is beginning to recede. And we're seeing more clearly who are the believers and who are on the unbelievers. And that's a good thing. Because it's hard to be saved if you think you're already saved, but you are not. It's hard to be saved if you think you're okay with God, but you're really not. And so you have to come to the point where you realize that you are not right with God in order to be saved. And so this morning, I would encourage all of us to... to Live a life of obedience to God against the peer pressure of the culture that's around us. And we seek to extend the godly culture of the church into the ungodly culture of our country. We seek to be salt and light to a culture that is spiraling downward away from God. And as we do that, we're going to see Wonderful miracles happen in our lives. Now what is a true believer? A, a, a true believer in Jesus Christ is someone who knows that they have eternal life. And that means when you know that you have eternal life, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if, if you were going to die today, God forbid, you know that you would be with Jesus in heaven. You have that assurance by the Holy Spirit in your heart. And if you're not sure that you're saved, if you're not sure this morning that you have eternal life, that if you passed away today that you would go to heaven to be with Jesus, if you're not sure, I'd encourage you to commit your life to Jesus Christ because that assurance comes to every true believer. It says in 1 John, I've written these things that you might know that you have eternal life. It's something we can know. It's an assurance that we can have. And so to become a believer, to become a Christian, is not just to say, I think I'm a Christian because I believe some of the things in the Bible, or I think I'm a Christian because I believe in God. The Bible tells us the devil believes in God. I mean, he knows God exists. I'm a Christian because my parents uh, took me to church. I'm a Christian because I go to church regularly or I go to church on Christmas and Easter or I'm a Christian because I'm a pretty good person. None of those things are what makes a Christian according to what the Bible says. The Bible says that to become a believer you need to A, admit that you've sinned. Admit that you've done wrong things and that has separated you from God. B, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross he lived a perfect life and died on the cross that your sins might be forgiven. And ask him to forgive your sins. And finally, see you commit your life to him to follow him all the days of your life. So I'd like to ask you to bow your heads right now and
If you're not sure that you're a Christian, if you're not sure that you have eternal life, I'd encourage you to pray with me so that you can have that assurance in your heart. Say something like this. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. And I'm sorry. I ask for you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and took my sin upon himself. I don't fully understand it, but he took my place that I don't have to die eternally. And he rose from the dead. He's alive today. I believe in him. I believe in the one who died on the cross and the one who rose from the dead and is alive today. And I commit myself to following him as my Savior and Lord, to doing everything he tells me to do. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you for your word. It shows us how to view our world and how to understand you. And we see the parallels this morning between our culture and the culture in the time of the judges. We pray that you'd help us not to repeat the sins of Israel as they allowed ungodly peer pressure to cause them to drift away from you. We choose to go against our ungodly culture. We choose not to walk in their ways, but to walk in your ways. I pray that each person here who's a believer would be strong and courageous. May we take the lead in witnessing about you to the unbelievers around us rather than being pulled away from you by them. We thank you, God, that you're with us each and every, every day. We thank you that you protect us. We pray that the light in our lives and light in our, in our church would continue to shine ever brighter in the darkness. We pray that you'd bring people to the light, that they might find you. And Lord, we pray for this live dead team in Egypt that's seeking to Plant churches in a, in a dark culture of a, a religion that's not the truth. We pray that you'd protect them. We pray that you'd give them wisdom. We pray that you'd be moving by your spirit on the hearts of people, that they would become saved believers, and that churches could be planted in that area. We pray that you'd meet every need. We pray that even this morning you would encourage them in their work for you. Do miracles, God, through their ministry. Move by your Holy Spirit that people might be turned from darkness, from Islam to the truth of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.